Uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, PIC Adda of this month, that is April 2022. Uh, this is Dr. Sangeeta Kale, Program Committee Member of uh, PIC, that is Pune International Center. With me on panel, we have Dr. Amitav Malik as the panelist. PIC basically is a think tank which is very active in conducting programs, conducting conferences, discussion sessions, competitions and topics of national and international interest. Social innovation, energy and environment, science and technology, national security, uh, literature and culture, economics, politics are few of the topics which are covered in uh, by Pune International Center. PIC is also actively engaged in writing policy papers on various topics of national interest and to present it to Indian government. PIC Adda is one such program under Pune International Center, which is conducted once every month. Temple architectures have always intrigued me, not only due to their exhibits on art and culture, but also due to their humongous single stone architectures and complexity or difficulty of the locations where they are located. It makes me always wonder as to how these structures would have been made during ancient times when the tools and equipments were so limited, communication was so difficult and commuting was rare. The cultural side is also equally complex wherein the temple carvings do exhibit a kind of advanced culture which is difficult to imagine during those times. These, all these topics and all these intricate questions are clearly enough, uh, are my, prob my, my uh, curiosities and I certainly feel that my knowledge on this subject is limited and I'm sure that that would be the same amongst our audience today as well. In this context, we have a magnificent speaker today with us, Shefali Vaidya. Shefali Vaidya is a writer, newspaper columnist, social media influencer, media personality, and an avid traveler. She holds a master's degree in uh, uh, mass communication from University of Pune, an advanced postgraduate diploma in Spanish language and postgraduate diploma in Indology. She writes in multiple languages, English, Hindi, Marathi, Konkani, as well as Spanish. She has her own bilingual vlog, Chef's Special, which is widely followed. Shefali Vaidya writes on a variety of topics, including travel, history, parenting, temple architecture, Indian textiles, politics, current affairs, arts, arts and craft, culture, travel, and human interest stories for several online and print publications. She also has niche heritage and textile trails for Wander First, a travel, it's a travel startup. Today, she will throw some light on history of Indian textile and its connection with temple architecture. It's a very interesting topic and I now hand over uh, the, the platform to you, uh, Sheikh Ali Man, for your talk. Over to, over to Sheikh Ali, please. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, Pune International Center for having given me this chance to speak about this topic. But a lot of you, I know this forum has had uh, very interesting conversations on economy, on politics, on defense, on many weighty subjects. So many of you might have a question that why talk about textiles? Why talk about history of textile when it's a Saturday morning? You could be talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. You could be talking about Jay Shankarji's visit to the US. Or at the very least, you could be talking about where do you get the best missile power in Pune? You know, all these topics are equally important. So why are you giving me one hour of your life to talk about the history of textiles in India? The answer is very simple, actually, because the history of textiles in India is actually the history of the Indian civilization. And why do I say that? I say that because if we go back in history and we go back from the time that we find recorded, excavated history, that is from the Sindhu Saraswati era civilization, we find that our history of textiles, the history of Indian textiles starts from that time. And that is almost 3,500 to 5,000, some say 7,500 years ago. And since then, we have had an unbroken tradition of weaving. 
we have had a unbroken tradition of uh, you know uh, decorating our textiles with motifs using different techniques and much of it has continued in india over this uh, 5000 to 7000 years even though politically the country has seen so many transitions it has seen so many rulers it has seen so many breakages it has seen so many disruptions it has seen so many economic upheavals but despite that this knowledge has been passed on from father to son from mother to daughter the the spiritual significance of textiles has also been passed on and that is why it's very important to study why indian textiles are the way they are let me take you back in time can i have the presentation please so my uh, presentation is rather evocatively titled ritual to spiritual because that is how the journey of indian textiles has been uh, next please so when we go back to the sindhu saraswati era civilization unfortunately textiles are a perishable commodity so we haven't have we don't have any uh, any any piece of textile that has survived so many years because it's it's not possible for a cotton or a silk textile to survive for 5000 to 7000 years but what we do have is we have the scraps of filament which have been found attached to a copper necklace a green beads necklace that you find in the slide in the excavations of chaudaro during the sindhu saraswati era civilization and after analysis it's been found that this particular filament is of a wild silk that is found in india and that is even today it's found and it's called tassa we all know even my saree is tassa now tasar was earlier known as kaushaya in sanskrit kaushaya why because it is made from kosha kosha meaning the uh, the cocoon of the silk of the wild silk worm so that is why it's called kaushaya and even today in chatisgarh tasar is called kosa because that kosa comes from kaushaya tasar is a wild silk that is found widely in india you have tasar weaving in maharashtra you have tasar weaving in chatisgarh you have tasar weaving in jharkhand you have tasar weaving in odisha you have tasar weaving in assam pretty much because that is the native silk that is found in india and it is still today very popular next slide please so in the same excavations in the sindhu saraswati era sites we have found these spindle whorls uh, with single and double holes terracotta needles and uh, you know our terracotta bobbins and all of these things they tell us that our ancestors not only did not know how did not only knew how to cultivate cotton they knew how to spin yarns from it they knew how to weave it into a cloth using a loom and they also knew patterning they also knew to color the cloth and they also knew to decorate it with motifs and patterns so when i talk about motifs and i talk about temple architecture the roots of this journey go back at least 5000 years which is a huge amount of time next please so this is the earliest evidence for weave woven textiles at harappa impression on a ravi phase bead from harappa dating to around 3300 bce and that is the textile impression obviously the textile didn't survive but if you can see on terracotta you can see the warp and weft of that textile weave to tell you that we knew how to weave we knew we had set up looms and we knew how to weave and that is a very complicated pattern that you see on the terracotta thing next please so all of us are aware of this we have seen this image in our history books it is the image of the famous priest king from mohenjodaro and you can see that he is wearing a shawl on his right shoulder and that shawl is decorated with what is known as a trefoil motif which is like you know three uh, parts to that uh, motif they say later on it is this motif that got developed into the famous paisley motif of india but as you can see from this image this we don't know whether this trefoil motif was block printed whether it was embroidered whether it was woven of that we don't have any proof today but we do know that our people knew how to decorate textiles they were not just weaving plain textiles but they were actually decorating it with beautiful patterns next please so now we come to the outfit that indians wore 
all over the world in all cultures we started off by wearing draped garments you can see that in roman togas you can see that in greek robes you can see that in mayan and incan cultures so uh, stitching came much later obviously though even though it, during the sindhu saraswati civilization era we do find needles bone needles that have been find, found so we do know that stitching existed even then but the trend was because of the weather and because of a lot of other things to wear draped garments so antariya was a lower garment which is kind of like today's uh, sarong lungi or whatever you call it uttariya was the upper garment which is today even today men in uh, odisha men in tamil nadu men in karnataka they wear it for religious occasions or for uh, special occasions it's called angavastram it's basically the antariya and uttariya you know translated today and then there was a kaya banda which was like a belt to keep the antariya in place next please so this is a famous vidarganj yakshi and if you see her robe if you see the bottom part of her robe you can see that it's very beautifully draped and you can see the folds of the cloth that have been translated in the front and in the back using stone which is not e very easy to do i mean but that is a different topic that is the topic of the the prowess of the sculptor which we are not going to talk about now but imagine the beautiful folds of uh, the rope that the the sculptor has depicted and he has depicted it from life from seeing it so our uh, textiles were basically so thin and diaphanous that they could be draped so beautifully and all the folds would fall beautifully well if you had seen pictures of the famous buddhas of bamiyan you would see that even there the robes are huge robes and the robes were beautifully folded and you know how that was done that was done with a very complicated process by uh, putting down huge ropes from the buddha shoulder and then covering the rope with actually a mixture of clay so that you get those folds very beautifully it's not that easy to do in sculpture but our people still manage to do that next please so now we come to the representation where we can see the draped ropes this is in gandhara art this is the first representation of buddha and you can see that how he is wearing his shawl and how it's draped very beautifully next please so this is uh, a gupta era sculpture it's from the dashavatara temple at devgarh and you can again see the beautiful drapery how they are wearing and it looks like they're not wearing anything in the lower body but if you look carefully you will see you can see their dhoti folds or you can even see the ankle length dresses but because the material was so diaphanous and so thin and so finely woven that it looks like they are not wearing anything in the lower body next please now we come to the ajanta frescoes which many of you might have seen they start at uh, painting them at second century bce and they continue for another 400 years if you see the frescoes of ajanta you can see for example i mean you, if if you can see that striped black and white cloth that one of the attendant has that is actually an ikat cloth which you can see being woven in odisha even today in a very similar pattern and you can see the jewelry you can see how the clothes have been draped and if you see all the frescoes in ajanta you will see that there is a distinct distinction between the clothes of the nobility between the princes and the queens and the dancing girls and today's fashions many of today's fashions you can actually see in the ajanta frescoes for example there is a, i don't know if i have the picture here or not but there is a there is a fresco of a lady who is wearing a blouse i mean you can see that she's wearing a wearing a elbow sleeves blouse and there is a pattern of ducks block printed in it next please next please so here you can see that that merchant he is wearing a white vest and he is also wearing socks presumably because uh, he came from a cold environment and you needed to protect your feet with socks next please now we see a sculpture of uh, maya devi giving birth to buddha and she is holding on to the branch and you can see the outfit that she is wearing that's actually a nayanar sari it's you can see that uh, that kashta style of wearing and uh, you can even see the pallu going on and blouse so it's very similar to the nayanar sari that is worn even today in parts of india next please this is the buddha 
Bodhisattva actually at Ajanta. And if you see his Kativastra, if you see his uh, his his lower uh, his waist cloth, you can see that it has that Pasapalli motif, which is the chessboard motif, which you can see woven even in Odisha in Odisha even today. This is more than two thousand years later. The same pattern using the same color palette is being woven even today. And I think it's a miracle. Nowhere else in the world has such an unbroken tradition survived for so long. Next, please. Here you can see again the woman who is standing behind. She is wearing a very beautiful ikat uh, robe, and you can see that it's in stripes, and you can see the beautiful pattern. You can also see a jewelry, which is also beautiful. Next, please. So now we come to how our textiles were viewed in uh, in, in in abroad outside of India. So one of the oldest Chinese sources, Han Chu, which was authored by somebody called Ban Gu, lists cloth among the goods from India presented to Emperor Wadi, and this is in first century CE. Even in first century CE, textiles made in India, and the photograph that you see, it's actually I've taken it from Getty Images. It's a photograph of uh, the Patan Patola, which is a double ikat, and double ikat where both the warp and the weft are dyed before they are woven. The yarn is dyed in this geometric pattern, and then on the loom, it's put together. And those iron needles that you see, those steel needles you see, they painstakingly. Uh, Put the warp and the web together, like one uh, one one uh, joint at a time, and that process takes a lot of time. And the more precision you have in that process, the more beautiful your uh, garment looks. Otherwise, it starts looking fuzzy. So this kind of technique is extremely time consuming, is extremely labor intensive, and it's very mathematically precise because you need to know exactly where each and wa each warp and weft have to meet to produce a pattern like this. Now this kind of double ikat weaving is practiced in only three places in the world today. One is in India in Patan uh, and in Rajkot now. Another is in Japan on one particular island. I forgot the name of it. And the third is in Indonesia. And Indonesia and Japan, both places, the art actually, the craft or art, whatever you might want to call it, it actually went from India. Next, please. Chinese pilgrim Fai Yan and later Arab scholar Ibn Battuta have recorded the role of Indian textiles that was so important in the lives of not just Arabs, but also in uh, for Rome as well as for Greece. We have been exporting textiles right from the time of the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. Those who have been to Lothal in Gujarat know that it was once a very thriving port. And through that port, we used to export many things like spices and textiles to Rome, to Greece. And it was so popular that the Roman historian uh, Pliny Senior has remarked that the Indian textiles were so beautiful and so thin and so much in demand by Roman women that the money of Rome is actually going out of Rome and it's going to India because Roman women only want Indian textiles. Now, when I see this, you know, I, I find it very ironic because I remember in the 80s and early 90s, we Indians had this huge craze of everything that was made outside India. So, you know, everyone went to Singapore, they bought those made in Singapore saris, uh, machine made saris, and those were sold at a huge premium. And this was it, like Indian money was going out of India. And here it's like before, uh, you know, in, in BCE, it there was so much in demand for Indian cloth in Rome that Pliny Senior was lamenting that Roman money is going out of Rome and because of in Roman women's craze for Indian cloth. So fine was the Indian cloth. In fact, so fine was the Indian cloth that the Romans actually called it Venti Nebula, meaning woven wind. It was that fine. Probably it was the muslin that we've all heard about, you know, that famous Dhaka muslin, which is like 1,000 count, 1,200 count muslin, which was so thin that if you wore layers of it, it would still seem like you were not wearing anything. Next, please. According to Marco Polo, Khambat, at, that's the Gulf of Cambay on the Gujarat coast was the midway hub for seafaring merchants from Mediterranean to South and Southeast Asia and beyond long before the Europeans entered. And here you see another 
very beautiful example of pattern patola weaving this is known as the bag hathi pattern where you can see alternating squares with tigers and uh, chabdi me hathi meaning elephant in a uh, in, in an ambari and this is all done in vegetable colors you can see that the colors are dull and it has survived this uh, article is probably 18th century or something like that the sari it's from a museum but it survived so well next please the 18th century was the turning point basically and why was it a turning point because by the time india had been colonized by the british and they sounded the death knell of the textile trade in india at the beginning of the 18th century india dominated the world of textile in fact with travelers who visited india around that point of time they have mentioned that whenever they traveled from europe to india and then to further east in every country they found the noblemen and the richer people wearing clothes that were made in india basically india clothed the world at the beginning of 18th century indian textiles were so beautiful and they were so varied and there was so much in demand that all over the world india was exporting textiles from the far east to the west and uh, india was getting a lot of money because of that but within 50 years after the east india company coming to india basically they destroyed the entire textile trade by its end the textile production and trade fell completely into european hands how did it happen i'll tell you in a bit next please next please so now we talk about different uh, uh, types of textiles but before that i want to tell you about a little about i mean i talked to you about the history of uh, uh, indian textiles i want to go a little more in details we have already seen how our textiles were you know the beginning was uh, during the sindhu saraswati civilization days now we come to the vedic era where weaving was considered to be an extremely prestigious uh, profession and not only that it had spiritual undertones so in the vedas in the vedic era literature you'll find several hymns where weaving is used as a metaphor to explain a spiritual context like for example there is a hymn which says that night and day are weaving the warp and weft of our life so our life is basically a textile woven with nights and days and that's how our life goes it's a very lyrical and a very beautiful very evocative image the male weavers were known as vayas the female weavers were known as vaitris and tantu was the name for a single yarn and tantra was the actual art of weaving sutra was thread so these concepts now if you see tantra is both the act of weaving as well as tantra is actually a spirit form of spiritual practice so where did this word tantra comes from it comes from weaving even in buddhism their key concepts are called sutras and uh, or tantu all these terms they actually come from weaving and that's how sacred weaving was to us and even now even today it is so today if you go to any puja even today you do ganpati puja at your home or you do any home or you do any puja you do navagraha home you will find that one of the key rituals one of the key things that we offer to the divine is a new cloth even when we have our festivals the first thing we do is we buy a new cloth when a marriage is arranged in the family one of the key uh, ritual things is to go for wedding cloth shopping lagna cha basta shopping as they call it and traditionally if you go to one of the traditional cloth shops in tamil nadu or you're even in maharashtra the entire family goes including the bride and the groom and when the cloths are flow when the textiles are selected when the sarees and the dresses are selected the shop owner does a little bit of puja and you know that gives a token as an as a harbinger of auspiciousness because the cloth is offered as not just something that you use it's not just utilitarian but there's a lot of emotion involved in it there's a lot of auspiciousness involved in it and that is why the cloth is gifted i mean you pay for it of course but it is given by the shop owner to the couple and their families with the wishes with the puja that everything should go off well for the couple it is a very uh, emotional attachment that people have with textiles and even today you've seen that if there is a wedding there are you know in maharashtra particularly there'll be uh, complaints from the bride's aunt or the groom's mother saying that i didn't get the saree that i deserved or i didn't get the cloth i deserved that is because 
textiles for us is highly emotional it's not about the money it's about the emotional spiritual attachment we have of for our textiles that is because our textiles are very intimately and closely connected with our spirituality with our religion and with the way we live our lives so now we come to in the vedas again the words like suvasas meaning wearing good clothes and suvasana which is for a woman wearing good clothes it's a term of great respect and people were expected to dress well whatever they could afford the best things they could afford but they were they were expected to spend money on clothes and they were expected to dress well after the vedic era when we come to kautilya's time in kautilya's arthashastra there is a mention about weavers guilds by this time weaving had become a highly specialized profession and weavers were organized in different guilds and these guilds were very autonomous and even when the king had to do something do business with the guild the king couldn't just barge in the king had to take permission of the shrestri of the guild and only then there had to be a certain protocol to be observed there had to be certain honors that were given and taken and only after that the king could go and uh, ask for a certain amount of cloth to be woven for him and it was offered also ceremonially with the weaver being honored and weaver being given his due price and also some respect so during that time weavers enjoyed both power of money as well as prestige and that was in a way the golden age for the textile industry of india after the after 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 ancient india when india went into the medieval era and with the advent of islam one major change that came into i'm not talking about uh, economic upheavals or i'm not talking about the political upheavals i'm talking about from the point of view of weavers one major thing that happened was that the guilds were destroyed and what replaced them was something known as the jajmani system the jajmani system means the weavers would now work in karkhanas or small workshops and the karkhanas were not owned by the weavers themselves or even by the weavers guilds but the karkhanas were owned by either by rich merchants or by the royal family or by the nobility in the islamic courts and the cloth woven there would be either sold by the rich merchants or kept for the personal use of the royal family or of the nobility themselves they didn't um, it's not that the weavers got poor then because the the ruling nobles actually they had very good taste and they liked good textiles and they seldom wore it is said that the mogul emperors never repeated their clothes so they constantly needed new clothes to be woven for them so the weavers got good money but they lost out on prestige from artists and craftsmen they became bonded they became not bonded laborers but they became daily wage laborers of course lots of good things also happened during this time there was a lot of influence of persian art into our weaving so patterns became more geometric they became more abstract new embroidery techniques were introduced to india brocade became very popular and uh, banaras in particular which had a very thriving weaver community which was mentioned by huen sang when he had visited india in the 7th century ce it it transformed a lot into uh, producing brocades which were geometric which had patterns like shikarga which is basically the hunting pattern which had floral patterns and uh, the use of animal motifs in uh, in in the weaving declined a little bit in north india because islam didn't permit that but there was a lot of innovation as well but from the weaver's point of view he was now no longer a artist or a craftsman who was respected and uh, who was honored and worshiped and who had its place in the social structure but the weaver became a bonded laborer who was only working for money the weaver could not decide his own designs and the weaver could not sell what he or she made in the open market that had to be done either through the private merchant who owned the karkhanas or the the all the textiles and goods were uh, supplied to the uh, to the nobility but even then the situation was not so bad weaving was thriving there were new experiments being done in weaving and things were okay the death knell to weaving was sounded as i said earlier by the british when the east india company came to india when east india company came to india they actually were enamored by the indian textiles so they bought indian textiles from india by giving gold and silver and spices of course and they took it back to europe where they were hugely popular even the royal family 
prefer to wear uh, clothes that were made in india and this were cotton and silk both the clothes interestingly when huan sang came to india in the 7th century he traveled all over india and he mentioned in detail what kind of clothes indians wear what kind of houses they live in and he mentions weaving centers in kanchipuram he mentions weaving centers in kashi he mentions weaving centers in mahishmati and he mentions weaving centers in gujarat and all four places the weaving centers exist even today because all these places were also places of, of spiritual significance kashi we all know kanchipuram we all know gujarat also had a lot of temples and a lot of places of spiritual significance and mahishmati was an ancient kingdom which was very well known for its temples and for, for its uh, contribution to hindu spirituality so weaving was always very connected to our spiritual ethos and it was one way of offering to the divine anyway coming back to the british uh, era so when the british realized that they were spending a lot of european money and buying indian cloth and they didn't want it so they passed something known as the indian calico act in 17 i forget the dates i'm very bad with dates let me check ha in 1721 by the time words like calico pajama jinjam dangari chintz and khaki these are all words of indian origin by the way had gone into the english vocabulary so popular were indian clothes in europe and particularly in england so to stop that to stop the flight of british capital from britain to uk they passed this calico act which basically said that uh, you cannot import calico cloth in uh, uk at all zero In 1730, actually, the British East India Company had ordered five lakh and eighty-nine thousand pieces of clothes in India. It contained a list of ninety-eight varieties of cotton and silk products. We don't have ninety-eight varieties of cotton and silk products now, unfortunately, because a lot of that knowledge is le- is lost. But at that point of time, there were close to a hundred different varieties, different weaves of cotton and cl- silk existent in India. The Calico Act was repealed in 1774 because by the time the British had stolen Indian designs, they had stolen India's wooden blocks and Indian designs, and they could replicate it using mechanized methods. So they had started the steam press. They had done many. Uh, they had invented synthetic dyes, whereas India was only dealing in uh, in mineral and vegetable dyes. So they could produce similar looking cloth in brighter colors at a much cheaper rate because they were using machines. in the late 18th and early 19th century indian calicos exported to britain had to pay a duty as high as 65% but the british cloth entering india paid only around 3.5% so basically indian cloth became more expensive even in the overseas markets and it became more expensive even for the domestic markets obviously by the time uh, british had already also done economic exploitation of indians to a large extent so indian population in general their purchasing power had started reducing greatly and compared to that then suddenly they couldn't afford to spend so much of time so much of money on indian woven clothes and uh, british woven clothes were cheaply available so the whole market basically shifted from indian woven textiles to british textile which looked similar because they had stolen the same motifs anyway and they were much cheaper so this is how basically the whole indian weaving industry collapsed within 50 years i'm not kidding this was mentioned by no other than william bentick who was the british viceroy he said in a speech in the middle of the 18th century that the bones of indian weavers are drying in the fields of india so much was their their uh, their desperate situation millions died by starvation people left their traditional professions and they took up soul killing jobs like they became menial labor they became coolies in calcutta but basically it was a very 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 big body blow to the indian weaving industry despite that now i'm coming to the end of the indian history despite that you might want to ask me how come weaving is still surviving in india and mind you india is the largest producer of hand woven garments in the world today and we still have practically every state has its own uh, typical weave or a typical technique of decorating a weave 
and that has survived even today despite so many economic transitions despite so many disruptions and the motives that we use are pretty much still the motives that we used to have even during the sindhu saraswati civilization for example during the sindhu saraswati civilization if you see their pottery if you see pottery that was in india in 5000 7000 years ago you will see that peacock was a very favorite motif the paisley the trefoil was a very favorite motif these motifs you can find in indian textiles even today even today a kanchipuram sari will have the peacock on the border so the peacock has stayed with us for almost 5000 to 7000 years as a motif in pretty much everything and not just in textiles you see peacock in temple architecture you see peacock in literature you see peacock in music you see peacock in dance you see peacock in paintings and even today if you visit any indian highway and if you see the trucks painted gaily you will find that out of 10 trucks at least four or five will have peacocks painted in garish colors behind them so peacock has transitioned from classical art to pop art and it still exists with us as a motif today because it has a spiritual significance but i'll come to that later so this is the history of uh, indian textiles and one of the things that sort of revived indian textile industry was the movement of swadeshi when people realized that uh, even dadabai nauruji was one of the first people to mention it that india has been reduced to just an exporter of raw material rather than an exporter of finished goods and it has become a dumping ground for finished goods from the west so after the swadeshi movement came into being in the early decades of the 20th century weaving and uh, spinning suddenly acquired more prestige and we all know the role of khadi that is played in our freedom struggle so somewhere there was a little bit of revival and now looking at 2022 we see that the whole world is moving towards slow fashion sustainable fashion vegetable colors and all of this is actually the original make in india produce we have a technical know how of vegetable colors that has been with us since the sindhu saraswati civilization days we knew how to use moderns then we know how to use moderns now we know how to hand spin our cloth we know how to hand weave our cloth and all this is actually the fashion of future so india has a great future uh, in the world of fashion today of course uh, like everything changes so uh, maybe the same textiles that were popular 2000 years ago are not so popular anymore but you could give them a new spin and you could you know you pitch it as a slow fashion or sustainable fashion and that is the reason why india's textile story is so important it is a link that we have with our past and it is the connection we have with our future next please so these are just very beautiful uh, beautiful uh, slides this is a paithani actually hand woven paithani you can see the peacock here also you can see the lotus here which are uh, motifs that have been with us for many 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 years next please So this is a revival uh, Kanchipuram sari, and you can see the beautiful parrot on its border. A parrot is called Kili in Tamil, and uh, it's it's a very beautiful sari. Next, please. This is uh, this gentleman is Sadev uh, Patra. He is a national award winning weaver from Noapatna in uh, Odisha. three brothers all three of them are national award winning weavers and this is a sari that he has woven using the ikat technique which means the yarn is tied and dyed first and then it's woven and you can see the calligraphy in there it's not that easy to get that finely uh, etched lines on cloth you know this is not pen or it's not painted over it's basically the yarn has been dyed before and it has been woven next please this is a typical kinari shawl and you can see how colorful uh, the motifs are next please this is uh, kashmiri sozni embroidery and you can see here the patterns are mostly floral and abstract they don't have animal motifs there but you can see the paisley there the famous indian paisley next please this is block printing it's practiced in many states in india under different names in gujarat it's called ajrak in uh, madhya pradesh it's called bag in uh, in in andhra it's called block printed kalamkari but it's basically the principle remains the same you carve out wooden blocks and then you dip them in paint and then you basically uh, do block printing on the textile next please 
this is brocaded weaving and this is a lady talking to a parrot why am i showing you with this particular motif is that this lady is called shukabashini this is one of the apsaras that you see outside temples you see them in belur you see them in some temples in maharashtra like the markandi temple you see them outside many temples and the lady she is talking to a parrot this is a very famous motif in our uh, you, you you find references to it in our literature as well but this shukabashini motif you will find again in textiles in temple architecture in literature in a lot of places next please this is a very beautiful example of uh, banarsi brocade very old about 150 years old next please so now we come to the significance of motifs what do they mean and what is the synergy between motifs in uh, textiles and motifs in uh, in, uh, in temple architecture can we move to the next uh, presentation please yes thank you so this presentation is exclusively about motifs and its synergy between temple architecture and textiles that's why i've called it sacred synergy next please so as i said uh, handloom weaving in india has been has been having a history of more than 5 thousand years and design motifs is one of the earliest method of decorating fabric as we have seen in the priest king shawl in the mohenjodaro excavations and uh, the design can be woven it can be dyed it can be printed and it can be embroidered and all four techniques are in existence in india in different parts with their own unique regional variations next please here i talk mainly about kanchipuram motifs because kanchipuram has been a major weaving center for more than 1500 years unbroken and even before that but these are the existing records that we find right from the time of uh, when huen sang had come to kanchipuram and he had talked about kanchipuram being a center of major center for indian weaving their sarees even today are renowned for their rich and varied motifs and it's mentioned in the books of patanjali who lived in the 3rd 2nd century bc yuan sang also mentions as i said earlier next please so what are the motifs that you find in kanchipuram saree cloth woven in kanchipuram was exported to destinations like rome as well as to southeast asia through a port called masulipatnam it was exported both to the east and the west and it has been a major temple city as well as a weaving center for more than 1400 years and that is why you see that many of the motifs that you see in kanchipuram sarees or kanchipuram textiles even today they are uh, inspired by temple architecture next please so sacred motifs like the parrot the peacock the two headed eagle and the pallava lion carved in the temples of kanchipuram have been inspiring the weavers for millennia and there is a definite correlation between the two because weavers viewed uh, the art of weaving a textile as an act of worship they believed that they were doing a sacred duty by weaving cloth it was not just a profession it was not just a vocation it was not just something they were doing for their uh, you know for earning their livelihood next please so weaving was deeply influenced by dharma and sacred motifs like the rudraksha like the tulasi plant like the arai madam that's the lamp niches sudarshan chakra hamsa were clearly influenced and uh, copied from temple architecture and translated into motifs and textiles next please but for that we need to understand a little bit about the hindu view of art if you read stella kramrish or if you read anand kumar swami you would know that hindu view of art is that we perceive everything according to our senses and that perception is called rasanubhuti and it's mentioned in our literature in vedic literature as well as in puranic literature and so the main aim of any art according to the hindu view of art is that it should invoke the desired rasa in both the creator of the article of art article as well as of the uh, onlooker so when a shilpakar is making a murti of a god who is smiling and it's supposed to invoke happiness in you when the shilpakar is creating that murti he should feel happy as well when he is creating that 
and not only that when you see the murti finally you should also get that feeling of happiness if you feel angry after seeing that murti which was intended to create a feeling of happiness then the creator has failed in his uh, objective so it's not good art next please next please so hindu view of art regards any object as a repository of communicable meaning and meaning has to manifest itself into the artist's imagination first therefore study of motive because becomes a study of meaning next please so motives in kanchipuram sarees and these motives are seen not just in kanchipuram sarees i have just taken kanchipuram sarees because otherwise the topic becomes too huge the canvas becomes too huge for me to give you a cogent presentation but these motives are seen in 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 textiles all over india actually but let's uh, focus on kanchipuram for the time being so the temple motifs command central positioning in kanchipuram sarees and these invoke the sense of the sacred in both the weaver who is making these articles as well as the person who is finally donning that article the bride who is wearing the saree or the bride's mother who is wearing the saree or the groom who is wearing the veshti whoever motifs tell stories from our scriptures and lend a symbolic significance to the fabrics next please the weavers of kanchipuram perceive their craft even today if you go and meet the weavers of kanchipuram they will uh, tell you that kanchipuram is a sacred city because it is infused with spiritualism it is infused with so many years of a unbroken spiritual practice and weaving sarees is the dharma it's the way of life dharma not in the sense of how you worship where you worship who you worship but dharma in the sense that this is what i am supposed to do this is my way of life it is much more than a profession it is much more than a vocation it is the dharma of the weaver to create a beautiful textile imbibed with sacred meaning just as it is the dharma of the traditional stapati to create a sculpture infused with sacred meaning every stage of weaving the sari is accompanied with a religious ritual even today right from the time when the yarns are dyed right from the time when the yarn is put on the loom right from the time the sari is ready and it's time to take it off the loom there is a ritual there is a small puja that the weaver does of the article and of the loom there is a small prasad offered and only then the article is taken off the loom what the shilpi does with the stone the kanchipuram weaver does it with the yarn next please most traditional motifs woven in kanchipuram are meant to be protective or auspicious because these uh, articles are supposed to be worn by people on religious occasions or on special occasions the weavers and sellers both believe that they are not just producers or vendors of textiles but providers of sacred views a closer look reveals a rich history of the design vocabulary that is common across art forms and this feeling that even the sellers feel that they are not just you know um, sellers of utilitarian goods but they are actually giving away auspiciousness you can see that in big sari stores in a city like chennai even today there's a store called varlakshmi it's a huge store three to four story store with uh, every layer every story dedicated to sarees in a certain budget but there is a temple inside the store and every time you buy a sari they have a in house priest there who will do a little bit of puja and will give you prasad and if you are a woman then he will give you bangles with it and a little bit of kumkum and it's a very touching small ritual but it's a ritual that makes you feel like you're not just buying it's not like going to a zara and buying a pair of pants or uh, going to gap or buying a pair of sweatshirt it is a religious exchange actually it's a spiritual exchange more than that next please so now we come to motifs next please so temple motif which you have seen in many sarees all over india you see it in odisha also in odisha it's called phoda kumba this particular motif this is also known as the gopuram design and you can see the similarity between the gopuram and this motif as i have juxtaposed it it is one of the holiest motifs used by the kanchipuram weavers when woven in borders it is supposed to bestow divine blessings and it's a series of large tapering triangles along the entire border and it's woven using the interlocking weft technique you find it in many other uh, places in india you find it in chatisgarh the same border you find it in odisha everywhere it's called temple border or they have their names in their local language. which but basically it is supposed to imbibe the article with a uh, with a feeling of good uh, faith and auspiciousness next please now we come to the yali motif a yali or a vyala or a vidala is a imaginary mythical uh, 
mixed animal which has a cat like body the head of a lion and the tusk of an elephant it is has religious significance it is the vahana of buddha one of the navagrahas and it is usually carved at the entrance of temples to ward off evil eye it's also used in the body and the pallu of kanchipuram saris yari sculptures are found on the walls of the varadraj perumal temple in kanchipuram among all others and you can see the similarity between the yari figure in the temple architecture and the yari motif that is woven this the below what you see is a cortex sari actually but it is stayed so faithful to the uh, temple uh, sculpture next please this is a very special motif which i like a lot it's called a arai madam motif and the top picture that you see it's from a temple in kanchipuram it is a niche in the wall of the temple where those little triangular uh, holes are basically used for lighting lamps for the temple and it looks very beautiful when it's fully lit and that uh, is called a arai madam that uh, motif has inspired this famous arai madam border in tamil nadu sarees particularly in the nine yard madisar sarees which brides are supposed to wear for their wedding rituals this border is preferred it's the same border is woven on the groom's uh, uh, veshti also and you know the reason behind it it's a very cute very beautiful reason the reason is it is because this particular border is identical on both sides on the reverse as well as the obverse so it symbolizes that when the young couple are wearing clothes woven with this border the bride is wearing the sari and the groom is wearing a veshti with the same border they are equal and they should remain together through thick and thin that is the symbolic meaning of this border next please did you know that i bet not Now we come to the Anna Pakshi motif, which is a favorite motif of the Kanchipuram weavers. You will find it in uh, borders of most of the Kanchipuram sarees. It is associated with divine knowledge. Uh, it is a hamsa. It has the ability to discern. It is said that in a uh, uh, in a lake, if you put one drop of milk in a lake of water, the hamsa has the ability to pick up that one drop of uh, milk. That it is that discerning. In temple sculptures, the goddess Saraswati is depicted with the hamsa as her vahana. Next, please. Now we come to peacock motif. As I said, peacock motif has been there with us throughout our civilization. Show us the hamsa motif, basically. But peacock motif, uh, I mean, peacocks are peacocks were introduced to the world by India. So peacock motif is something that is very very close to Indians, and we see that in jewelry, we see that in lamps, we see that in as I said, trakaat, we see it everywhere. It is known as mail in Tamil Nadu. It's a favorite motif since the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. It is so special because it is associated with immortality, courtship, fertility, wisdom, and protection. And the peacock is seen in different places in India, but everywhere it looks different. because it reflects the regional sensitivity and the regional aesthetics by that i mean that a peacock that you see in the kasuti embroidery of uh, say karnataka or the peacock that you see in the patola textiles of gujarat is different from the way the peacock is depicted in the kanchipuram sarees having said that without compromising on the peacockness of it as in it has the feathers it has the tura on the forehead it has the long neck it has the slender limbs but at the same time it there are regional variations and that is another uh, another salient feature of indian art so uh, kind of like i'll give you an example of say rag darbari rag darbari when it's sung by uh, bhimsen joshi rag darbari when it is sung by pandit jasraj rag darbari when it's sung by uh, gangubai hangal sounds very different even though it's the same rag because the individual artist has the freedom to diverge and then come back to diverge and then to come back on the sum just like that all artists in india including the weavers and the sculptors they have the freedom to diverge within certain boundaries as long as you keep the peacockness of the peacock intact you can go overboard in trying to depict it the way you want it that is very unique about our art next please now we come to the parrot motif parrot motif again is a favorite for bridal sarees because parrot is supposed to be the symbol of love it's known as kili in tamil nadu and it is a messenger between lovers and whenever you see madan and rati that is the indian couple 
uh, gods of love you will find rati with the peacock always depicted goddess kamakshi is who is also the goddess of kama desires is depicted with a parrot in her hand and the parrot has been always associated associated with courtship love and passion that's why on bridal sarees you often have the parrot on the pallu and the borders and paithani with the with a raghu border is uh, considered to be very very auspicious as bridal attire next please now we come to the elephant motif my favorite animal i always say that elephants are my favorite people in the whole world they're amazingly beautiful graceful animals so animal is uh, elephant is again a motif that you will find across india in all different kinds of art forms it is known as a yana in tamil and uh, it is uh, associated with strength and prosperity and long memory goddess lakshmi is shown flanked with two elephants in temple sculptures and in temples the elephant is always shown as the base of the adishtana supporting the temple saying that this temple is so strong that it is basically held aloft by a line of elephants and elephants are again a very popular motif in uh, the textiles woven in india next please now we come to the lion motif lion motif is particularly popular in both odisha as well as in uh, in kanchipuram because the lion was a kalinga symbol as well as the pallava symbol and uh, it is seen in karnataka as well because it was a hoysala symbol as well but in all these three places if you see the local textile you will see the lion is tweaked slightly differently so that it looks different in each of the textiles so if you are really into textiles you can look at a lion motif on a sari and you can say without knowing where the sari is from whether sari is from odisha whether sari is from karnataka or whether sari is from tamil nadu so it is found in pallava temples this is the kanchipuram lion it's a symbol of ferocity and power and it's found in temples like the vaikuntha perumal temple next please lotus motif known as the padma seat upon which the deities are seated it's a symbol of spiritual awakening and purity and the three stages of the lotus the bud the the semi uh, blooming lotus and the full blown lotus they represent the past present and the future respectively in the sari it is usually used as a repeating motif on the borders as well as the body motif in temples it is used as a ceiling motif at the base of the Uh, seat where the deities are standing in 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 many other decorative places next please now we come to ganda birunda again one of my favorite motif it is known in tamil as the iruthalai pakshi it is a two headed eagle it is supposed to be a mythical form of shri vishnu and it is supposed to possess immense magical strength the picture that you see below the sculpture is of a massive ganda birunda sculpture in a temple in karnataka it is considered to be uh, an aspect of lord vishnu not avatar an aspect actually and it is open, often used as a corner motif in kanchipuram sarees and nowadays i find it even in odisha sarees where it is woven using the ikat technique next, next please so uh, to conclude temple motifs are inspired by nature religion culture and beliefs of the people and textiles were always considered sacred in india even today and therefore motifs woven in them had a deep symbolic meaning it was very simple you wear a textile so when you're wearing a textile with a sacred motif you are praying to the divine that let me be protected with this sacred symbol many of the motifs in kanchipuram sarees are inspired by temple sculptures many of the motifs in odisha sarees are inspired by temple sculptures from odisha from the kalinga style of architecture and similarly in uh, if you go to maheshwari sarees you will find that the borders of maheshwari sarees are inspired by the designs of the windows of the entire maheshwar uh, temple complex that is there and you see the similarity in weaves everywhere even in kashi you see it so significance of the motifs used in kanchipuram sarees lies in the feeling of auspiciousness and purity they invoke in the wearer and whether the wearer also gets the same feeling of goodness and protection and happiness that the weaver has intended the article to be infused with that is the difference between uh, indian textiles and textiles made anywhere else it is this 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 view of art it is this view of textile as a sacred entity which is why i say that the history of indian textiles is actually the history of indian civilization so now that we have talked about the past you might want to ask me what is the relevance of all this today why is it necessary that we talk about indian textiles and what is the way forward 
we talk about indian textiles because even today indian textile sector handloom sector is the second largest employment sector for indians after agriculture about 70% of people involved in this sector are actually women they are working from their homes and this is the only source of livelihood for them and this is a tradition that has survived for thousands of years in india despite so many political upheavals despite so many economic upheavals despite conscious attempts to destroy it like the british did but we have still survived and in that sense it is like the story of india itself which is why it is our duty as indians to patronize this craft because it is a craft that keeps us in touch with our roots with our spirituality with our culture with our heritage and that is why it is essential to know the history of indian textiles thank you for listening so patiently thanks a lot uh, chef ali ma'am for a very very excellent talk and a very wide coverage that you could give uh, in terms of time also in terms of the way in which our, our culture and heritage has been evolved uh covering like 5000 years of uh, of history uh is actually very difficult and you could really do it in a magnificent way i, ca I can see the the uh, comments and i can really understand that it was highly appreciated by a lot of uh, audience who are here today with us um it um, i have uh, myself i have some question but uh, uh because of the paucity of time i will just uh, quickly ask the questions from the audience so uh first question is this that um uh it's it's a small paragraph i'll just read it for you so thank you very much for this wonderful session i have heard that our ancestors used to make sarees that were so fine that it could be folded and put into a small box like yes. a magic box Yes. Uh, so recently, I've been following the wonderful uh, um, findings of uh, Upan Upanya Samas by Sri Dushyant Shridhar, and he clearly okay. states, yeah, he clearly states that Sita Mai was uh, fully checked with royal sari and jewelry when they yes. went to Vanvas. Uh, yes. Earlier, it seemed a myth, but considering that such fine textiles were made, it seems very possible. he mentions that hansa motifs on saree being specified in valmiki ramayan uh, yes. is this true he says and any thoughts uh, on this particular uh, see there are there are there are mentions both in the mahabharat as well as in ramayan about very fine cotton and silk textiles the bahavarat mm -hmm. mentions that when yudhishthira did the rajasuya yagya lord of kings came from all over india with presents for him and there the presents are listed actually which king brought what and then in those presents it's listed that kaushalya vastra that is the wild silk uh, attire was brought silk attire was brought cotton attire was brought wool attire was brought from kings uh, based in different parts of uh, india and offered to yudhishthira even in ramayan actually the mention that when sita got married and when she came to ayodhya she got uh, as a part of her uh, entourage she it is mentioned that she got many articles of very finely woven silk and jewelry and finely woven cotton and valmiki ramayan actually says that when they were going to vanvas she didn't know how to wear valkalam valkalam is basically very rough uh, attire made from tree bark and uh, ram had to actually help her uh, to uh, you know undress uh take out all her finery and all her jewelry and all of that and wear the rough valkalams which was difficult for her because she was very young and she was a princess used to luxury so i am not sure whether she went to vanvas wearing all the finery or not it seems a little illogical to me but uh, definitely she when she got married she was married in the best of uh, finery and she was sent to ayodhya with the best of finery with her in both textiles as well as jewelry Mm -hmm. and yeah. about this diaphanousness actually there is a famous uh, quoted quote of aurangzeb uh, once when he saw his daughter he chided her for wear, not wearing anything because it looked like she was uh, not wearing anything and she said i am wearing 17 layers of uh, finely woven dakka malmani it was so wow. fine it wow. looked almost like she was not wearing any i don't know if this is true or not but uh, it's a it's a it's a story 
if it's if it's true it's amazing that the way in which they could be no but the diaphanousness is there like if you mm. go to verul today our mm. our texas is definitely diaphanous if you go to te- verul today and you see i don't forget the number of the cave name of the i think it's rameshwar but outside the cave there are two sculptures of ganga and yamuna one on each side and if you see them you see that they are wearing clothes but they so diaphanous that it look like they're not wearing anything and this kind of diaphanousness you see later on in marble sculptures of italy of renaissance sculptures or whatever but this was done in verul in 8th century ce so our textiles were definitely very very fine gossamer thin diaphanous and transparent of that there is no doubt amazing amazing uh there's one question by mr sujit uh, very interesting presentation about synergy between art and religion the interplay between an artist and their art is striking um an artist's mood influences their art kind of science on the other hand expects the observer to be detached from their object which perhaps explains the friction between science and religion uh, do you have any comment on this uh, no not really science <laughs> is not really my area so so no no comment actually i wouldn't say that there is any friction because um, uh, because whatever is there in the religion and also whatever you have explained right now in terms of arts and culture is also a fact it's i mean it's true and it is something which is which is an observation so i don't see anything uh, in fact one can actually try to learn more of scientific achievements you know to really find out the way in which these people might have done their sculptures during that time in terms of uh, yeah. the way the colors were were made and you know they were embedded into the te- into the textile also in the in the temple architecture in fact science has to do much more and try to understand all these things which uh, has been already done and uncovered uh rest of the questions are mostly related they're not questions they are comments amazing sessions uh, it was a great session and all all these comments are there uh and would like to know more on vedic um, hymn and uh, wrap and weft of night and day i think this question is by mr jadha and he's mm-hmm. trying to find out uh, would love to know more on vedic hymn on warp and weft As i can uh, i have this wow, the exact vedic uh, rhyme with me but i can't i mean i I'm, i'm not going to be able to quote it right now but that mm-hmm. is a whole different subject i mean uh, our textile tradition as per the vedic era and vedic literature is a topic of a full fledged 45 minute session on just on mm-hmm. that i i i barely scraped the surface of it i can imagine in fact that this one hour is very small for you uh, ma'am because uh, there are so many things that uh, that you know people would want to know from you and uh, a special session maybe on only temple architecture will be also so very interesting uh, yeah. maybe we'll invite that, that you once a, again yeah. yeah that would yeah. be an amazing session actually i've been writing a column on just on temple architecture and the mm. sheer variety of temples architecture styles in india and how they have developed over the years it's really fascinating fantastic fantastic talk and for the rest of the audience who have questions let me tell you the entire video is uh, is on youtube you may definitely see this and you will also get the presentation slides there so let me thank you uh, shekali ma'am for a, for an excellent session uh, and in spite of these this long weekend we had have we have had good uh, good audience and that uh, actually depicts the interest that people have in in this particular topic So thank well, you. I'm well. glad that uh, it was worth their while, and uh, I stopped you from discussing where you can get the best missile power in Pune. But I think it was <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, and uh, let me thank you once again. Any any comments uh, from anybody of on the on the panelist if it's there? Otherwise, we can. Uh, quickly wrap the session let me just uh, at the end tell that uh, pic will have the next uh, session uh, as a lecture on societal applications of space technology uh, this will be given by dr dipti devakar she is a chair professor at isro and uh, this will be held on 19th of april at 6 o'clock in the evening and it will be chaired by uh, professor malik 
so after this session, let me just thank uh, Sheikh Ali ma'am again, once again, for coming over on PIC platform. I hope that we'll be able to see you much more often uh, at PIC. Uh, and for that, uh, we can we can talk independently. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the to all the audience and we can conclude the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much.